Good afternoon. The love of my life says that a meeting with another person is always a meeting with yourself. And last night, I struggled with this presentation. I had a dress rehearsal here, and it went terribly. And I took the train home to my village, which is an hour away from Oslo, and I met a man. And that man, he sat in the train, and he told me his life story. He told me about his successes, he told me about his failures, and he told me about his aspirations and his motivations, and he reminded me why I'm here today. I am wrongfully credited for change. Change comes from diversity, working together on a common goal. That's it. Um, as an anthropologist working in these corporations, it hasn't always been easy to explain to others what I do. And there's a group of anthropologists here in Oslo who come together on the uh, idea of working on the edge. Uh, we talk about different things, and we're actually writing a book about our own experiences working on the edge. And one day, the head of my company who really doesn't know how to talk to me at all, um, came by. It's a Friday that we do this, uh, at Friday evenings. And it was 5 o'clock, and he was on the way out the door, and he goes, what are you guys doing here? And we looked at him and said, well, we have a group. It's called Working on the Edge. And I introduced each person, and knowing very well that if I introduced them as anthropologists, that would just be like, eh. So I said, this person works for the defense, and this person works for our audit, the national auditing uh, system, and so forth and so on. And he freaked out because he thought, customers, customers, customers. So he tried to understand, what is it that you guys are talking about? And suddenly this light bulb popped in his head, and he took us to this painting. And I don't have a picture of the painting. I'm not even sure I could use it. So um, I got one of my designers to draw this picture. Um, but there was a poem by the painting, and the poem was, come to the edge, he said. We can't, we're afraid, they said. Come to the edge, he said. They came, he pushed them, and they flew. And that showed me that he really did understand the essence of what we do. Our jobs are to go and tell these stories, exactly like the story I just told you of the man on the train. I can tell you more stories. I was so nervous about what to wear. My daughter loaned me these shoes. She's one of my heroes. It's all about the silent heroes behind a person. So I'm going to ask the audience three questions I'd like you to think about for the rest of the presentation. And that is, is what is your value? And what is your asset? And I hope it's not what the woman before me said. Um, what are you most proud of? Just hold this thought, keep thinking about it. And now I'd like to tell you the story of people-centric innovation. It's always about starting with people. Their aspirations, their motivations. When you understand the aspirations and motivations of everyday people in their everyday lives, you can, you can actually create with them products and services that are meaningful, relevant, useful, and desirable for them. The path for me hasn't been easy, but people's involvement is crucial. And I really didn't understand how important until I started working for Microsoft. And I failed. My first job at Microsoft was to, and this is in the 1990s, was to go and take 40 families across the United States and study them as they set up computers in their homes. And the usability laboratories at Microsoft told me, on average, it takes somebody three hours to set up a computer. So I thought, OK, I'll put on average six hours and go out and do this uh, per family. So I traveled around, and one of the families was Howard and Martha here, and I have lots of stories about Howard and Martha. And I traveled around, and um, of my 40 families, none of them were able to set up a computer in three hours, six hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, and it got worse. So as a 
good researcher. I came back to Microsoft and I gave them my results. Houston, we've got a problem. And they said two things. The first they said was, where'd you find these stupid people? <laughs> and the second thing they said was, what do you know? You're just an anthropologist. And I thought to myself, well, you're right about that. I'm still just an anthropologist. But you are so wrong about those people. And I got mad and I put my foot down and said, I am never going out alone. You guys are coming with me. And I forced leaders and managers and developers and designers all to come out with me into the field and meet these 40 families and experience it for themselves. And it was at that moment I understood the importance of co-creation, creating for the people we serve, but with the people we serve. Howard here was involved in so many projects. Both Howard and Martha were with us until they died, almost 10 years. And Howard, at the uh, end of Win the development of Windows XP, my favorite operating system, um, he was brought on stage in front of all the developers and designers of uh, this product. There's thousands and thousands of people involved in this. And he was thanked by Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and he stood there so proud. But it was the audience of Microsoft employees who roared their support at him. It was truly an amazing moment. And as I said, he stayed with us along the years. I have had the privilege of going into families. Oh, I forgot to tell you a very important story. What happened when I made people go out is we made videos, tapes. We taped everything we did out there. And uh, those tapes went around the entire company. And uh, um, one day I got called from the head of Windows. And I thought I was getting fired. He made me come to his office, and I was really scared. And there he sat, and he said, stop humiliating me. How much money do you need? <laughs> so it, it pays to stand by your, your values. It, it pays to stand by what you believe in. Um, my story actually begins, though, when I was a little girl. And I do love this picture because, as you can see, I am not the shortest person in the room. <laughs> Um, but there's something much more important. I grew up in Asia and moved from country to country, and um, it has its advantages and disadvantages. And you'll hear a little bit about both of those. But I found out that the most important tool I use today, I learned in daycare center, and that was to make friends. I had to understand these children from their perspective and not my own. And that's what I bring to the table as an anthropologist. I help companies, organizations, public, private sector to understand the aspirations and motivations of people from their perspective and not from the company's perspective and not from the organization's perspective. When I was 16, I didn't have such a happy life. In fact, I was pretty miserable and I was a mouse. Um, I was sitting in the back of the room. I couldn't talk. I was afraid to open my mouth because I was afraid I would fall apart. One day, a man, a teacher, came to the room with a book, The Shape of Content. And in that book was a list of things to do before you become an artist. And I thought, I don't even know if I want to live the next day. Why would I be thinking about this? But I read that list, and something inspired me. And I'll tell you what was on that list. It said, go out to the vineyards and pick grapes. Go put your hands in the soil and pick potatoes. Read books in foreign languages. Go look at the architecture in Europe. And above all, observe people and listen to people and engage in conversations. Well, I decided, OK, I'm going to give life a little bit of a chance. And I would follow this list. And if at the end I still had no hope, I was so angry and sad in those days. If I still had no hope, then I could end it. So I boarded a plane. And I was so frightened. And I went and followed that list. And at the end of it, I found 
that we have, live in a very sad and beautiful world. And I met people who saw me for who I was, and I learned to forgive, and I also learned that there really is something out there called love. Because of this, I became an anthropologist and a psychologist, and it was combining these two disciplines together that I understood that I, too, could help people find out who they are and what they can do with their lives. The next is, my daughter, when she was two years old, taught me to take off my own blinders. Osa Marie, you know she's Norwegian because she has a striped uh, uh, t-shirt on. Um, she liked two things. She liked mama's chicken soup that takes 12 hours to make. And she loved a very bland cookie called Maria Shex. And one day I find her and she's putting them together and I scream, Osa, what are you doing? And she looks at me, are you stupid? She didn't say that, the look. She said, I'm making cookie soup. <laughs> Why is that important? Well, she taught me that we are all born curious and we are all born with creativity in us. It's innate. But the most important thing is, this is also a definition of innovation. Taking two seemingly unrelated things, putting them together to create something new that is meaningful, relevant, useful, and desirable for her. And that's okay. What stops us from uh, the people-centric approach? Well, first of all, it's a mindset and not a method methodology. What stops us is our blinders, our cultural blinders, our educational blinders, our expert blinders. We know it all. Then why, oh why, in the world that we live in today? Today on the news, I heard from the German prime minister, we're in a global crisis. Whoa, that's news. <laughs> on the one hand, we are over in inundated with information. There's an information overload, and the real question we're asking ourselves is, how do I know what I do not know? I do not know I need to know to get my job done. Then on the other hand, we have empowerment through technology. We're more empowered than ever before. We demand transparency, and we want to be involved. All of us want to be involved. Why then? Well, first of all, it takes a courageous leader to understand that they cannot control the uncontrollable. Why do we keep using these mechanistic tools from the Industrial Revolution? Pavel told me, Pavel has been through two um, concentration camps and a death march. And when I asked him, how do we do this? He said, it's very simple. We need to live and teach, love, and humanity. Were Amanda's, were the kids of the bullies of Amanda Todd teaching love and humanity? The children didn't kill Amanda Todd. Technology didn't kill it. What happened was that Amanda couldn't take anymore. But we have a responsibility, everyone in this room, because technology doesn't just enable wonderful things. We need to change this. Through my studies, there are four things that people are asking for. We all want to be seen, heard, and accepted for who we are. We are searching for ways to move in and out of chaos. We want to create our own experiences and share them with others. And we want to be everyday heroes. My value is in my integrity. My asset is I'm always a foreigner seeing things through foreign eyes. And what I'm most proud of I dedicate this to my children and to Howard and Martha, because when Howard died, what happened was I got hundreds of mails from Microsoft employees condol with lots of condolences, but one of them stood out, and it was from the head of technical support, who said, there is a corner of our technical support building to remind us, called Howard's Corner, to remind us of who we're building for and who we're building with. Thank you.